Hello, this is B. Sure to Noop, and I'm Jesse Hathaway. A little bit about myself. Um, I'm a long time Linux me mechanic. I've been working, doing sysadmin type stuff for over 20 years. Um, I feel most at home um, in front of my X term with my TMUX and my VIM. Um, I think one thing that's a little bit ironic about my career that I just thought I'd mention is only recently have I really come to appreciate both the elegance and the insanity of the uh, Bash shell language, um, which might be surprising after 20 years as a sysadmin. Um, so if you enjoy um, Bash, uh, hit me up. I'd love to chat about it. All right, so that's enough about me. Um, terminology. So there's really only one term um, that uh, might be new or is used extensively in, the t in this talk, and that is the NOOP or NOOP. Um, it's supposed to be pronounced NOOP, but at Braintree, we always pronounced it NOOP, so you're gonna have to forgive me. Um, I'm gonna use uh, that pronunciation throughout this talk. Uh, and what it is, is it's a dry run or a simulation. It's a flag you can pass to Puppet so that it will list out the changes that Puppet is going to do without actually performing those changes. And if it's working correctly, the NOOP output will exactly mirror um, the changes that are actually executed once you remove that flag. Now, uh, you might be familiar with the new power put if you've ever passed that flag um, to, pup to the puppet agent. Um, so here we have the log output um, with the new flag. Um, in this case, it's showing for our hot proxy config, we're adding um, some log output to standard out. So you see that diff there. Uh, then down at the bottom of the slide, you see that the service hot proxy is going to have a refresh triggered, uh, which is Puppet's odd way of telling you that your service will be restarted, which of course is very important. So the title of this talk was Be Sure to Noop, and I'm going to make a claim here, and I'm just going to read this verbatim and then um, talk a little bit about it. So the claim is that reviewing Puppet commits and testing changes in development provides an incomplete picture of the changes that will be advanced in production due to the differences in contextual data between environments. Reviewing Puppet NOOP outputs for production provides an important safeguard against any unforeseen effects of a commit. And all that is to say is that your production environment and your development environment, regardless of how much effort you put in to have them be exactly the same, in the end, there will be differences in the context and the data of the production environment. And using NOOP outputs um, as a means to protect against unforeseen uh, changes due to your commits is an important safeguard if you want to have um, a highly available production environment. So, to further motivate that, I'm going to do just a couple short demos uh, with Hot Proxy and Postgres. So here we have uh, we have a development environment up here on the top. We're going to apply some code here that we uh, that we wrote. So here's our Hot Proxy patch. Let's take a look at uh, the code we wrote. So. We have a, a hot proxy config. Um, we're going to pass in um, some, some data to that config, uh, this auth enabled flag, and we're going to default it to false. Let's take a look at what that's going to do in our template. So here's our, our template down here. And uh, we have a monolithic app, um, but we've, you know, we've heard that microservices are hip. So we're breaking our app apart. Um, we're creating an auth service. And so in our development environment, if the auth service is, an, if, if this auth enabled flag is true, we're going to um, request that hit the, the root of our app. We're going to then pass down to this new backend that we set up down here. So we don't want this to go out to production because auth's not set up there yet. So that's where we, we feature flagged it here. We send this through CI, we have this code reviewed, everything looks great. Down here, here's our production system. Our service is up and operational. 
Uh, Puppet then goes out um, and, and applies our configuration. And uh, uh, unfortunately, it looks like our code did go out. Let's make sure our website's still up. It's not, which is terrible. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, revert that change. We're gonna get our website back up here. And then we're gonna talk about what happened. So in this instance, our code went out even though we had defaulted to false. And that was because someone prior to us had enabled that flag globally in high road. Maybe they had made a mistake, maybe we had made a mistake, maybe they put it at the wrong higher level for, there could be a number of reasons, but that flag ended up being true and it went out and took down our website. Now let's do another example with Postgres. All right, so we're, we're more savvy now. Uh, we're not gonna try to make that higher error again. So we, here we, uh, we have a similar look up here. We're gonna um, pass an, an ENV flag to our Postgres config, an environment flag. We're gonna default to, to the dev environment. And let's, let's go down to the template and see what, what motivates it here. So in our production environment, we run our database on localhost and we put a PG bouncer in front of it as a connection pooler. But our, in our development environment, we don't do that. So we wanna hard code this address here. So we've added this to our template so that we can uh, hit the database in the development environment. So we pass this through, you know, code review and CI, everything looks good. Uh, our database is up right now, everything looks great. We go ahead and apply that in production. And our code didn't go out, so that's great, which we didn't intend it to. Um, or I mean, it didn't change it. Uh, it's still localhost, which is excellent. But we added a new line here and we restarted our database. Now, fortunately our database came up, not super tragic, but we could have had a minor outage there or a longer one, depending on how, how long your database uh, took to um, restart. So what happened here? Well, we made an all too common error for anyone who's ever written a template. We didn't clear the white space here on the right side. So because we didn't clear the white space, we introduced a new line and our puppet is set to you know, restart uh, Postgres when the configuration file changes. And that caused a, a momentary outage. Now, there are other ways you could design this to try to prevent that. You could never restart Postgres due to a uh, configuration change, have that be a, you know, a manual operation or some other way to review that. So there's other safeguards you can put in, um, but the argument that I'm making in this talk is that looking at this noop output for your production systems can be an important safeguard um, for unintended changes going out uh, to your production environment. So just a little backstory on uh, our use of Puppet at Braintree. Um, We've been using a masterless setup uh, with uh, this plugin called Supply Drop for Capistrano. Capistrano is an orchestration tool. Um, Supply Drop provides a, a way to do the noops and do the applies in a masterless fashion, similar to Bolt. Um, and then we have some internal scripts that aggregate that noop output for review. Um, but this has had, has had problems as we've grown. One, uh, the, one of the most important pieces as is there's no way to correlate the noop output with a specific commit. So if 20 commits are going out to production, you'll see that noop output with every single change from those 20 commits, but there's no way to correlate an individual change in the noop output with an individual commit. And because of that, the person who um, pushes out our, our, our production um, puppet code has to have broad knowledge of all the systems so that they can review the noop output and have a good sense of whether these changes are intended and whether they're safe. In addition, as the number of hosts that we have has increased and our puppet code base has increased, uh, the time to run these operations has, has grown dramatically to the point where it's no longer um, acceptable to have an operator spend that much time 
um, running through these nukes uh, in production. So we have uh, designed a new system called Heckler. And Heckler's aim is to correlate commits with puppet nuke changes and then allow those nukes to be reviewed prior to them being applied um, in production. And uh, it's an open source project and it's currently operating in production at Braintree. So this is kind of the end state that we're going through, going for that Heckler provides, this idea of the nuke approval. So here we have a commit uh, that's referenced here by the SHA at the top. We have the commit uh, message. You can click on the link to see the, the, uh, the source code change. And then we have the, the nuke output down below. Here we're adding some lyrics to the puppet show. And so you can look through this and review it. So what Puppet does is it's going to run a noop across every host in your entire environment for every commit uh, in your Git repository. And then it's gonna, for every, sorry, for every new commit, uh, you know, it won't run for commits that have already been applied uh, in your production environment or any environment. And it's gonna correlate a commit with a noop change by creating a Delta noop. And we'll talk a little bit more how that happens. And then it's gonna aggregate noops together, which are identical. And then it's gonna ask um, a set of approvers to approve the noops. And once they're approved, it's finally gonna go ahead and apply those. So this is here is a little plot process flow diagram. I'm not gonna to go too deep into this, but this gives you a sense of how it operates. It's gonna look, are there any new commits that have, have occurred um, on, on the branch that I'm watching? Have those noops been, sorry, any new commits? Have those commits been nooped? If not, I'm going to, Heckler's gonna go out and noop those commits. And then once it's nooped all of the commits, it's going to create delta noops that correlate the, an individual noop change with a commit. And then it's going to aggregate all of those noops together, create a GitHub issue to seek approval, and then apply them once they've been approved. So the um, source of truth that Puppet uses, we saw the noop output previously at the beginning of the talk as a, as a textual log output. So Puppet also provides that in a serialized form in the Puppet report. So this is a, a, it's, it's a YAML document. You can, you, it's also the document that's sent to PuppetDB um, and it provides some really great information. So, so first we have some log output here for the hot proxy, hot proxy uh, resource. I omitted the diff because it wouldn't fit on the slide, but that would have included the exact diff um, of the hot proxy config file. And then in the resource statuses, it's going to show you every single resource that's changed. So, uh, importing, you know, an important piece being at the bottom here, the service is going to have the. It says it's going to be changed. It's going to get the refresh from um, its dependent hot proxy config. Now, there's some oddities with the report. The logs aren't. Um, part of the resource status, status objects. So you have to do um, some, some matching of resource elements uh, to get the entire picture of, what, of what's happening to your resource. Um, but Heckler uses this information um, to, to, to understand the exact changes that are happening with the noop. Um, so to create the Delta noop, Heckler noops a, a, a given commit and then noops the parents of that commit and subtracts the noop output um, from the parents of the commit. And so that provides then only the noop changes that occurred in the commit. And you can visualize this subtraction um, by a textual diff of, of both the, the noop and the delta noop. So in this case, the in the parent commit, we have these lines, well, this is the diff. And so in the parent commit, we edited it in both, the noop output in both commits shows that we um, changed this laugh track and added some lines here, there's some waka waka lines. And so because we see that in the parent commit as well as the target commit, we can subtract that from the parent commit because we know that it didn't occur in the target commit, it happened before in the parent commit. So we subtract that and we're left only with our update to our, our index.html file. Um, and that's the only change that happened in that commit. So once we have 
those delta noops, we can aggregate them together. So here we've, we are, we're changing this, this cast file and we've aggregated together and we know that it's happening on, on three nodes identically, Fozzie, Statler, and Waldorf. All three nodes are having the exact same um, noop change going out so they can be aggregated together. Then once we have that aggregated information, we can open uh, uh, an issue on GitHub and seek approval. The approval flow is driven by the code owner's file. And for folks who aren't familiar with that, that's a, a GitHub construct. Um, the GitLab also has it as well, where you can have a, a file which applies, allows you to uh, um, describe ownership of files within your repository. And using that, um, you can apply ownership to either a node, a file, or a module in your source repository. And then Heckler will use that to ask who needs to approve a given change from the noop output. Once that's, once all your changes have been approved, Heckler is going to go out and apply them in an environment. It supports staged rollouts. So you can say, these are, these are my canary nodes. I want them to be applied first. And then after that, I want all my nodes to be applied. So that part is configurable, configurable depending on how you want your rollout to occur. So let's give a demo of how Heckler operates. So here's Heckler running up on the on the on the top pane of my Tmux here, and let's go ahead and, uh, and make a commit. So we have a module here. All right. So here's our module. Let's say uh, you know we decided we don't want to use Nginx anymore, so we're going to purge that. And we think the lyrics are just a little too long, so we're going to remove some here. All right. Let's take a look at uh, our diff here. Okay, looks good, we like it. We'll go ahead and commit it. Okay, commit looks good. We're gonna go ahead and push that out. When we, when we push it, Hackler is gonna know that he's going to recognize that a new commit was pushed. And we're gonna see that pick up in the top pane. And once uh, Heckler notices that there's a new, so you see there's the new commit. And Heckler now is nooping that commit across our hosts. Then we're going to go ahead and tag it. We're going to tag this for a new release. And we're going to push our tags out. Now, now that we push the tags, Heckler is going to go out and create a new milestone associated with that tag, and it's going to associate all the commits that happened between the last tag and the most recently pushed tag, and it's going to create a, a GitHub milestone with all of those issues. So let's take a look to see if that's been set up. Here's our new. It's associated with our the V8 uh, milestone. We'll take a look at it. It has all the information that we're looking for. It's got the noop output. So this is the noop output for Fozzie, Statler, and Waldorf. It actually ran um, Puppet on those nodes and aggregated this information together. We have our approvals here. I think it looks good. So I'm going to go ahead and approve it. OK, now we're going to go back and see Heckler pick up that information. Okay, so Hackler's noticed that that our that we're approved, and it's going to go ahead and apply. It did the canary apply first here on Fozzie, and then it continued with the rest of the apply on Statler and Waldorf. And now all our nodes are are at V8, and the code has gone out. So that gives you an idea of of how Heckler operates in the happy path. There's obviously lots of challenges. It's been a super fun project to work on. One that I wanted to note um, a particular, I think particular interest um, working with Git. I thought I knew, I thought I had a pretty good grasp of how Git worked internally, um, but working on this project has taught me a lot about Git. It's been a lot of fun. Um, one, one, I, one, one challenge I wanted to talk about in, in this in, uh, for a little bit is Git history. So I always thought of Git histories I had some sense that it was a graph, but I 
I'm so used to using the Git log. I think about it in my brain as a time ordered linear history uh, most of the time because I'm always just typing in Git log, looking at the history. And so it, in a linear history, it's very easy to look at the parent and noop the parent and provide that delta noop. But that the Git log format is a convenience format. The truth of the matter is it's not time ordered. It's a, it's a, it's a directed graph that um, has, has branches that are not ordered by time, but are ordered by when, when, when you, at what part you branched off of the repository. So in this instance, we have a branch that came off at commit A. And then we have our main repository continued off of commit A to, to commit B. And so uh, we actually went out and in production and applied all our hosts at commit B. And then when this person was, was done with, was finished with their branch, they merged it into uh, our, you know, our, our main branch. And uh, so then Heckler wants to go out and noop all these commits so that they can be reviewed. Now, if it wants to go out and noop commit F, it might naively think, well, I can just subtract the information from the noop information from commit E and provide that delta noop that we're seeking. Well, unfortunately that doesn't work because for the, the delta noop to work um, accurately, all the commits that are applied in production have to be in the lineage of the commit that we are, the target commit. And in this instance, commit B is not in commit F's lineage. It's not a parent of, or a grandparent of commit F. And so we can't nuke that because we don't have the changes that were made in commit B. And so if we nuke commit E, we're not gonna see those changes. So in this instance, Heckler can only provide the delta noop of the merged commit. So it can take commit D and subtract away commit F and commit C and provide that delta noop, but it's not able to provide the delta noop for commit F itself because the lineages have di diverged on, uh, on, on what has actually been applied um, on your hosts. So that's just one of the challenges um, that, that I've come across while working on Heckler. There's many more. Um, there's lots to, lots to do. As I, as I said, it is operating in production, but it's open source. I'd love other people to contribute. We have lots of fun things on the roadmap. I'd love to get Bolt support, obviously. That would be great. Um, supporting the nooping of pull requests. There's some, some fun challenges around that with rebasing and making sure that you can, the, the noop output is going to be the same once you apply that in production. I'd like to support other providers like GitLab, improve the command line usage, have some Slack and have some Slack integration. Um, so it's lots of things. I'd love to have other people help out. Just a few credits here. Um, one of the libraries we use is Puppet Parser. Um, that's from Puppet's Lira project. It's a Go library that parses Puppet code. It's super helpful. Um, I'd love for someone to use it and write like a Puppet pump tool so we could all uh, automatically format our Puppet code uh, and be done with uh, manual formatting. Um, supply drop, it was Bolt before Bolt. We, we, we've used it at Brain Free Tree for a long time. We still use it. Um, so that's a great project. And, uh, and then the song by OO, IOO, be sure to loop inspiration for this uh, talk's title. Uh, please check it out on YouTube. And uh, that's the end. Thanks. Be sure to noop. Uh, hit me up. My contact information um, is below. I'd love to hear from you. Thoughts, ideas. Um, and obviously, pull requests. All right, thank you.